Good evening. If I could ask folks to take their seats. Welcome. I'm David Scobie, the Executive Dean of the New School for Public Engagement, one of seven divisions here at the New School, and I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's program, Occupy Everywhere on the New Politics and the Possibilities of the Movement Against Corporate Power, co-sponsored by The Nation Magazine and The New School. Ninety-three years ago, a group of New York professors and journalists came together here to call for a new kind of institution, a new kind of university. It wasn't meant to be just a repository of past learning, but a place of present action, engaging the most consequential, consequential issues of modern life and the present moment. It would be committed to the role of higher education in building a vibrant democratic culture. This is the hour for the experiment, and New York is the place, the call for the new school said. That, at any rate, is our founding narrative, our mythology, and over the years, we've lived it sometimes more fully and sometimes less. We know this is a movement, a moment to live that commitment fully. It's a moment when something new in the history of American democracy may be taking place, may be happening through the retaking of a place. And so it is even more of a pleasure than usual to work with our longtime partners at The Nation and host this discussion on the significance and possible futures of the Occupy movements. I want to thank especially our longtime partner, Peter Rothberg of The Nation and my own colleague, Pam Tillis, for working so hard and so quickly to make it possible to bring all of you here tonight. Tonight's panel will be moderated by Richard Kim, executive editor of The Nation. Richard is co-editor with Betsy Reed of the anthology Going Rouge, Sarah Palin, An American Nightmare. <laughs> and he spent the past month reporting from Occupy Wall Street and has written about it in the current issue of The Nation. In the words of our university's founders, this is the hour for the experiment and New York is the place we are delighted to be part of this democratic hour and this democratic place. Richard Kim. Thank you. Wow. Wow. This is, this is amazing. All right. So I'm just going to bring the, the panelists out. Come on, have a seat. And um, while they're coming out here, I just want to do some housekeeping. Um, you recognize that guy, huh? All right, so I just, I really want to thank Pam Tillis and Dean David Scobie of the New School for hosting this event on such very short notice, and also providing us with electronic microphones. Um, so we don't, we don't have to use a human microphone, even though I love the human microphone. Um, it's, it's the latest, and, but hopefully not the last. It's the latest, but not the last, in a series of collaborations with The Nation magazine and The New School, and so um, you should all really plan to occupy this space again in the future. Um, and, and a thanks to Peter Rothberg for the nation, of The Nation for putting this event together, and the um, really wonderful and soon-to-be world-famous Nation interns um, who ushered you in here, and um, who, uh, without them, this event just would not be possible. So we're going to devote the final part of this evening to your questions, and you're, you should have received index cards when you walked in. Did people get index cards? Yes? No. All right, so they'll be coming around, and we're going to ask you to write your questions on these index cards, and then we'll collect them. And um, you know, I'll sort of just throw them up in the air and pick one. And um, that, that's sort of how we'll determine um, questions. Um, so how many of you have been down to uh, Occupy Wall Street? All right. So 
you know, we've been asked to, to actually to, to not call it Zuccotti Plaza because that's its slave name and we're going to call it Liberty Square because <laughs> it's been reclaimed by the people. So, you know, I just want to say today, Occupy Wall Street alone has fed thousands of people. It's hosted an exhibition on Occupy Art. It's held a teach-in about why public resources should go to create jobs instead of to bail out corporations. It's educated people on nonviolent tactics, led a course on the history and practice of direct democracy, held a meditation session. And right now, there's a meeting of the General Assembly going on. Somewhere, I'm sure there's also drum circle drumming. Um, that's just what it's done today at Liberty Square. Um, as those of you who have been down there know, there's just simply no substitute for participating in the direct democratic discussions and actions that take place there. And so I really encourage you to experience it for yourself firsthand. This event is not a substitute for Occupy Wall Street. It doesn't speak for Occupy Wall Street. Nobody can. Um, what we do want to do here tonight, though, is to shed some light on the political and economic context for the Occupy movements and to reflect a bit on what the possibilities Occupy has opened up. And I see people are so excited about that, and so that's, that's something we really, you know, just have to think about. Um, I think it's safe to say that the past few years have witnessed what we can call a democracy deficit. Right? And that, that's the stark and galling failure of our political institutions to serve the people that they are supposed to serve. Um, poll after poll show that Americans want Washington to spend money to create jobs. Um, but the conversation in Washington right now is about uh, in the supremely undemocratic super committee. And they're focusing not on job creation, but on austerity and how much of it to have. Right? Um, American people intuitively know, and many economists agree, that extreme levels of inequality don't make don't just make life miserable for millions of people, they make the whole economic system untenable. And yet, for the past 30 years, Washington and Wall Street have pursued policies that have created a situation where the richest 400 families in America, and look around you, because that's about how many people fit in this room, right, um, own more than the bottom 150 million families, right? <laughs> right. So, so it's these issues and injustices and many others that Occupy Wall Street has shoved into the mainstream conversation by seizing public space, by refusing to give it up, and by demanding to be heard, right? Are they going to succeed in breaking through the stranglehold that corporations have on American power? Are they going to succeed in making, uh, restoring basic economic sanity to our country? You know, the thing about small d democratic movements is we don't really know where they're going to go and what unimagined features are going to open up. But our amazing panel of such amazing brain power and experience here is going to take a stab at it. So introducing them, um, Michael Moore is a world famous troublemaker. <laughs> and you can read his version of events in his latest book, a memoir appropriately called Here Comes Trouble, <laughs> Stories from My Life, which just went on sale this September. Michael, yep. And um, you know, he has been traveling around to occupations across the country from Denver to Portland, to Oakland, Michigan. And so we're gonna hear a little bit from him about what he's seen and heard on, on his travels. Um, next to Michael is Patrick Bruner. Patrick is <laughs> Patrick is a member of Occupy Wall Street's Direct Action Working Group, its public relations working group, and structure working group. He's also the public relations coordinator for OccupyWallStreet.org, which is a news and organizational resource for occupations around the world. And when we were planning this event, um, we just really wanted to have someone from Occupy Wall Street represent them. And, and, and we were thinking about, it's sort of wrong to kind of, for us to cherry pick one activist. So we turned it around them and asked them to send someone. And we're very lucky that they sent Patrick, because he's been there um, since, since the first planning meetings, well before seven, September 17th. And he can speak from his experiences about Occupy Wall Street, although he did, he did also want us to note that um, you know, it's a movement of diverse voices and that no single person speaks for the movement, um, including him. Uh, next to Patrick is Rinku Sen. <laughs> Rinku is the president and executive director of the Applied Research Center, a racial justice think tank, and she's the publisher of Colorlines.com, a daily news site about racial justice issues, and I have to say, Rinku, it's just been looking and reading so awesome these days. So congratulations on that. Thank you. 
She's the author of The Accidental American, Immigration and Citizenship in the Age of, Age of Globalization, and she's written an article about racial justice and Occupy Wall Street in a re recent issue of The Nation magazine. Um, for more than 40 years, Bill Greider has shed a light on who has power in this country, who doesn't, and why. He's reported from inside the White House. from inside Wall Street's closed meetings and from the headquarters of multinational corporations. His legendary essay, The Education of David Stockman, and Bill, I looked at it today, but it's 19,000 words long, so I, I, had a, <laughs> I had a hard time getting through it in, in the hour I had. Um, revealed for the first time the bad faith and contradictions behind Reaganomics from inside the administration itself. And his book on the Fed, The Secrets of the Temple, is a must read for those seeking to understand America's recent economic history. Naomi Klein. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Naomi Klein is a columnist for The Nation, and she also has this week's cover story, which I hope you guys have received, um, called Capitalism Versus the Climate, which, among other things, examines why climate change analysts might just be right about one thing. And I'll let Naomi unpack that a little bit later. Um, between her books, No Logo, and The Shock Doctrine, as well as her documentary film with Aubie Lewis called The Take, which is about the people's response to Argentina's economic crisis, Naomi has laid out the indispensable critical narrative of neoliberal capitalism's rise to power and the democratic resistance to it. So this is our panel. Um, I cannot tell you how excited I am. So, Michael, I want to I want to start with you. You've been going around the country making documentaries for decades now, and um, about the disappearance of work, about the uninsured, about you know the capture of, of government by Wall Street, and millions of Americans have agreed with you. You won an Oscar, um, but I could imagine sometimes it was a little lonely out there. Um, and then this just comes when along. you're winning an Oscar, that's the only time it was lonely. <laughs> Uh, you know, a couple dozen anarchist types organized the occupation of Wall Street, and then within a few weeks, we have a global movement. So I just wanted to ask you, why this, why now? Um, you know, what's the sort of secret behind Occupy Wall Street's success, and what have you seen as you've traveled across the country? Uh, well, thank you, and, and thanks to the nation and uh, the New School for putting this on tonight. Um, this is one of the most uh, remarkable um, movements uh, that I've seen in my lifetime, um, precisely because it really isn't a movement in the traditional sense. I think that it has succeeded because it hasn't followed uh, the old um, <clears throat> motifs um, that we're used to in terms of organizing, um, but it has its roots in all the good works that so many people have done for so many years especially in the last 30 years since uh, Reagan took office and the decline and destruction of the country and essentially the world began um, its, its modern day um, uh, disaster. I think that, um, uh, you know, so many people have done so many good things um, and, and we've always had different groups and, and different different constituencies that people have been able to um, rally behind different causes. Um, but it, it, this, from what I've seen, and I've, like you said, I've been to maybe a half a dozen or more of, of the different Occupy things. It's, this thing has spread like wildfire. I mean, it is, I wish you could have been traveling with me the last few weeks. It has been the most uplifting heartening thing to see so many Americans of all stripes um, deciding that they're just going to occupy and they don't have to call into central command <laughs> for uh, permission um, there are no dues to pay uh, there's no leader to get permission from uh, there's no meetings subcommittee meetings um, uh, you know all these things you have to go through it literally is something as simple as some people in Fayetteville, Arkansas, just decide to create Occupy Fayetteville, and then 400 people show up. 
Um, I was in Grass Valley, California, Nevada City. 400 people there. Uh, you don't hear about any of these because um, well, the media uh, either won't or can't cover it because they, they're, they've, they've been so decimated themselves to, in terms of reporters and bureaus that don't exist anymore. So it would be impossible to kind of show the breadth and the scope of this movement. But it is, it is massive. It is building uh, each week. And, and everybody feels that they have permission to be their own leader. And the reason why I think this works, I know a lot of people can say, well, you know, it's got to get more organized, or it's got to have a plan, or it's got to, what's the, what's the agenda? Uh, what's the way forward here? What's the, what's the next step? Um, you know, it's enough right now that this movement just, first of all, it's already had some, it's already had some important victories. It has alleviated despair in this country. It has, it has, it has killed apathy. It has changed the conversation in a profound way. Seven, uh, eight weeks ago, all we were listening to was about the debt ceiling and the deficit crisis. And though you never, nobody's talking about that distraction uh, any longer. They're talking about the real issues now that are facing the majority of Americans, jobs, uh, the fact that millions are, of homes are underwater, uh, that 50 million people don't have health insurance. We have 49 million living in poverty now. We have 40 million adults who cannot read and write above a fourth grade level. They're functional illiterates. That's the nation that corporate America and the banks and Wall Street have created. And when somebody asked me the other day, well, who organized this? Who organized this movement? And I said, well, actually, Goldman Sachs organized it. <laughs> Citibank organized it. BP organized it. They did, they did the organization. And, and I think that, you know, it's, to, if you want to trace the current roots to this, somebody, I was being interviewed the other day, well, you know, at the end of your last movie, you were wrapping the crime scene tape around the stock exchange, and you, you called for this uprising. I said, no, yes, I did. But, but you know, it's not that. It's not a, a magazine from Vancouver. It's not... It, if, if, you wanted, if, you, if you really want to pin it down to somebody, um, I would thank Bradley Manning, and here's why. Um, a young man with a fruit stand in Tunis became very upset because he couldn't figure out why he was just getting screwed and why he couldn't make it. And, and he read a story put out by WikiLeaks that exposed how corrupt his government was. And he just couldn't take it anymore. And he set himself on fire. That event, by giving his life to this, created the Arab Spring movement that went across the Middle East and then boomeranged back here um, to what has been going on in the fall here in North America. And, um, but if one courageous soldier hadn't, allegedly, um, <laughs> done what he had done, done it, if he hadn't done this, it, it, who knows? But it was, it was already boiling just beneath the surface, and it just needed somebody to get it going. And thank God for you and your friends who went down there on that first day, who endured the ridicule first, then the attacks, um, and then the attempts to co-opt, um, but they have held strong, and and and, and it's not now. It's not just the people who can camp out overnight. It's it's seventy two percent of the American public who say they want taxes raised on the rich. That's never happened before in this country. It's 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 people taking their money out of Chase and Citibank and Wells Fargo and putting it in their credit unions, and it's it's it's. It's taken so many forms um, that, and it can't be stopped. And it's so, it's so great to watch Fox News and the others try to wrap their heads around it because they can't get their brain quite, like it can't, it can't grab onto it, which is great. That's what's, that's what's great. It, so I'm a, I'm a big supporter of it staying leaderless um, with a lack of a certain amount of organization uh, uh, that it um, that it remain in its in its free and open state 
and um, and thank God for all the young people who are who are willing to not take it anymore. And uh, I've just been inspired by it, and um, I'm I'm glad that I got to live to see uh, mm -hmm. what I uh, believe or hope uh, will be be the beginning of the end of a very evil system um, that is unfair and it's unjust and it's not democratic. So thank you. So, Patrick, Patrick, you, you were one of the organizers who has been there from the, from the first day, one of the people that lit this incredible spark. And I, I, we're just all, I think, incredibly grateful to you. And, 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 but, but you've been there for a long time now, and, and you've, you've seen a lot of struggles inside the movement, and you've endured um, the, the first the ridicule and name-calling, as Michael said, and, and, and the, always the threat of police, and now the threat of winter. Um, so if you could give some advice you know, to other occupations who are, who are maybe starting off a little later, or to students of grassroots movements who will be studying you and your movement you know, in generations to come, what, what would you say? Um, what advice would you give about why this has worked so well? Okay. Um, well, I think there are many reasons why this has worked. Um, you know, obviously, we have a great history behind us. Um, Tahrir Square, uh, the uh, Indignados in Spain, uh, these are movements that are, you know, very, very similar to our movement. You know, the way that we are organized, direct democracy, egalitarian values. These are, these are things that we think deserve to be central in every movement. And we think that's a big reason why we have been successful, is that our tactics and our values and our goals, they're all the same. And, you know, we, obviously this has to do with a, a, a break in the way that we view the world. 85% uh, of the class of 2011 moved back in with their parents. That's something that you know, has never happened before. We have youth who are aware that their future has been stolen. Because that's true, that's true. And we have everyone else who, who, who's watching that and who sees that the, that the youth's future has been stolen and believes that their future has been stolen as well. You know, uh, the Tea Party is, it comes from the same mindset as we do. You know, although we have many differences, you know, those are people who, who had legitimate grievances against this, this system that they had tried to work for their entire lives, and then it ended up screwing them. And, you know, that's, that's what's going on with my generation. We have uh, kids who have massive amounts of student debt, and they're, you know, going to carry that for the rest of their lives, possibly. You know, uh, not if we have anything to do with it, but... <laughs> You know, and so, so my, my biggest advice would be to, you know, realize that we are a part of something new, but that we come from a long tradition of resistance against this system, resistance against systems of oppression in all forms, because that's, that's what we're really doing. This isn't, in many ways, you know, like you said, this isn't a movement like other movements have been. This isn't a protest. This is a way of making a new space. We've, we, we have taken... Liberty Square, we have renamed it and we have rebuilt it into something that we believe is a better model. Maybe it's not perfect, maybe it's not what we'll come out of this with, but it's a way to at least start a discussion, a real discussion about all of the things that ail us on a daily basis, the things that are never really discussed. Like you said, before this, you know, the biggest discussion in American politics was whether or not to raise the debt ceiling for the 103rd time. You know, now we don't talk about things like that. Now we're starting to talk about wealth inequality. We're starting to talk about greed. You know, we, we, we've had fun looking at Google Trends and seeing that words like that have gone up, you know, in usage a thousand times. So, you know, these are things that, there's a, there's a, a real shift in terms of the mentality of people. There's a psychic break that's going on that we're riding because of, you know, because of what they did to us, you know, uh, uh, 40, 47% of the wealth is owned by the top 1%. And, and that number's gone up since the, the Great Recession, or whatever they want to call it, has begun. Since this new depression has begun, this new global depression that's affecting everyone. You know, and, and this idea that we're broke, I think that that's, that's one of the things that, that really pisses everyone off. Because we know that's not true. 
You know, this is the richest country that's ever existed with the richest people that's ever existed, uh, or that have ever existed. And none of them pay anything. And, and the idea is that we have to pay for their mistakes, for, for things that they don't even consider to be mistakes. They think they're winning. And I don't think any of us think that anymore. So I want to I want to get back later to that that question of austerity, right? Because that is one of the things that that Occupy Wall Street has really managed to to put on the table. Um, and yet, Washington and the eurozone are still having that conversation. Um, so so maybe we'll get back to that in a bit. But Rinku, to you, um, Patrick has has talked about how this has sort of been built on the shoulders of other of other movements, and and you've been there in in other movements. Um, fighting for immigration rights, um, anti-racist movements, um, uh, movements around homelessness and go. poverty. Um, you know, in the early days, mm -hmm. Occupy Wall Street was criticized by some people for being a sort of white, middle-class college thing. Um, there was a sort of infamous incident when civil rights activists and Congressman John Lewis was prevented from speaking at a Occupy meeting in Atlanta. But since then, you know, I have seen a lot of great collaborations. Um, Occupy Wall Street has gone up to protest many times, stop and frisk policies in Harlem, putting their bodies on the line. What do you, what do you think you know, is here in terms of the potential for collaboration? And, and, and what are the tensions right, between this new force in American politics and you know, the, the, those organizations that have been really working for decades in the trenches? So, um, you, know, you know that saying, and that thing that people do in families when they want to say how much they love each other, they say, I love you this much, and they make their arms really big to <laughs> indicate that there's a lot of love there. Um, there's A friend of mine has done something different with that, where she says to her, um, the kids that she takes care of, um, she says to them, I love you this much. Can you all see my gesture? And so instead of putting her arms out, she puts two fingers together because nothing can come between us. I love you this much, because nothing can come between us. And contradictorily, I think that the relationship between existing movement, uh, existing organizations and the Occupy movement has to be both. It has to be about love that's this much and has some distance, and love that's like this and has no distance, where nobody can come between us. And uh, that's because I think that the Occupy movement has needs to have some autonomy, it does. And I, I really think it was very, very smart not to have demands, you know, right out the gate. It's not a campaign. So organizations do campaigns and movements do something else. They shift the public will. And so the Occupy movement has to retain its ability to do its primary job, as I understand it, which is to keep shifting the public will and, and making that psychic break happen and supporting that psychic break. And at the very same time, it has to be like this with all the people in communities, working people, uh, unions, homeless people, tenants, immigrants who have been struggling for so long to make particular things happen and to get back some of the stuff that was stolen from us. So at the very same time, you have to have this kind of um, distance and autonomy and be operating like you like in this way where nothing can get in between occupiers and uh, all of the uh, people who have been fighting for a long time. On race and diversity, the, the main thing I want to say is that diversity by itself is not enough. It's not actually enough for the Occupy movement to be racially diverse, which it is. I know many, many people of color who are very invested in their local occupations, who have shown up, who have slept on site, who are uh, bringing food and supplies and water and uh, leading marches and so on. So the people of color, from my perception, whether it started that way or not, we are there now and we are part of the movement and we claim the movement. And yet it isn't enough that there are simply bodies of color and faces of color in the park, in the plaza, in any plaza. Uh, the real question is, are those people who are there able to influence the agendas of local occupations in particular? Are they able to help people who are, who are attracted to Occupy Wall Street get 
moved back out to all of the organizations and campaigns and uh, efforts to really win things because I know you're attracting a ton of people and they're going to do work. They, you know, can't hang out at a park all day long. There must be other things that need to happen. Um, well, maybe you can all day long, but the next day <laughs> it seems like maybe there might be room to make something happen. And um, it's like, you know, when you go to a party, you get invited to a party, and maybe you like the person pretty well and respect the person who invited you to the party. You go to the party, and you don't like the music, but you have no ability to change it, and it makes your head pound. So the DJ doesn't take requests, and the iPod is like glued into the system, and you can't get it out. If, you, if that's the case, you don't like the music and you have no ability to change it, you're not going to hang out at that party very long. You're going to leave and either make your own party or, or go home, I guess. Um, so the question is not really, can you get the people of color to the party? It's, can they change the music uh, in a way that helps them stay at the party? And I think that if Occupy Wall Street is going to cause this public shift, a really significant part of that shift has to be the ability to recognize the role that racial discrimination, racial exploitation, racial hierarchy played in getting us to this very depression, not just historically, but... 10, 15, five years ago, last month, uh, the ways in which redlining and mortgage theft and predatory lending and long-term employment discrimination and housing discrimination got us to the place where our economic systems do not work for anybody, including struggling white people. That didn't, uh, struggling white people weren't Many have always been struggling, but there's, you know, I was saying in the green room that the 99% used to be the 98%, and somewhere in that 1% are some white people, you know? Uh, <laughs> and they would not have, they wouldn't be moving into the 99% if, in fact, there had not been a whole set of mechanisms and structures that were actually designed to take stuff from people of color and to disenfranchise people of color that then ultimately always, always, always bleed out to affect everybody else. Thank you. Thank you. So, Bill, you, you study U.S. history in the, in the long view, and... Um, a lot of people have been throwing around sort of historical comparisons of Occupy Wall Street and, you know, let's say the 1930s radicalism where people just sort of prevented foreclosures from happening, um, or the 1960s, and there's been a lot of worrying, I think, from some liberals that uh, you know, Occupy Wall Street is going to sort of recapitulate the, the extremism of, of, the, of, the, of the 1960s. You, you have a different historical comparison you were making to me the other day, and so I, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, first, I have to say, <clears throat> I have a personal stake in the success of this movement. And it goes like this. I spent the uh, last uh, 25, 30 years of my life basically writing about what happened to democracy and the failure of our representative system, but beyond that, the power and money, um, the global trading system, the Federal Reserve, the bank, the mechanisms by which this happened, and some somewhat wishful ideas about how we might reclaim our birthright. Some of you may have noticed who, who read these books that the more I wrote about democracy, the worse it got. <laughs> and I was not unaware of that myself, and yet I kept doing it. And I, and I did it for a pretty obvious reason. It made me feel good to tell this story. And I thought it would help some people. But I developed a more complicated historical theory about what I was doing. And it goes like this. Um, the American pulse for democracy, the, the, the thirst for equality, for, for freedom, is a little like an underground river that has run underneath the surfaces of American history from the beginning. And it's, it rarely is visible, at least to the established powers. It gets misled, deflected, stymied in different ways. <clears throat> but it continues these ideals, the, the original promise of what this country could be. And I told myself, OK, I don't know if anything changes now. It doesn't seem to be happening. 
but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be in that stream with the others, the historic stream, and do what I can and at least keep the candle lit and the loft. And, and that's, that's a good thing to do with your life. Then, sometime, often unpredictably, this underground river gathers force and it breaks through to the surface and everything is changed. And you can read American history and find those moments which changed everything and opened the vista of, of a different country. I think that's what we're experiencing right now. I literally mean that. Um, and I think it's a, it, it, we know it's, it's a high risk enterprise to try to build an authentic social movement. Many arise and fail or, or get crushed. And the ideas are literally pushed back out of the public square. But they go back, they continue somehow. And, and maybe come back a generation or two generations later. So we have to, I think we have to take that sort of long view of what we're doing. I feel, uh, because, I've, because I know a lot of that history, I see a, 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 an ironic resemblance between what's happening right now and the populist movement of the late 19th century, 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Um, and I'll tell you some of why I feel that. These were farmers in the South and Midwest mostly who were being crushed. I mean, literally stripped of their property and turned into peasants uh, by pretty much the same interests we're up against today. The rise of industrial capitalism, the money trust, the bankers, and just the, the hard prejudices of American society. And yet they, they rose among themselves. They knew, they knew this about their situation. Nobody was on their side. Certainly not the money classes and the uh, economic system, and not the government either. So if they were going to change anything, it had to come out of themselves. And they started having meetings, first in Texas, and the idea spread. And it's a long, wonderful story. I, I, I urge you to check out Lawrence Goodwin's history called The Populist Moment. It, uh, I, I promise you will be inspired about the capacity of American potential. And you will also understand uh, how hard it is to do what we're trying to do. And uh, Larry Goodwin has, is a student, a stern student of social movements, nothing sentimental about the man. And he understands how hard it is to make this happen. And he's described in great detail, I won't go through here, the stages of development that keep a movement centered on what it really wants to be and, and fighting off the opposing forces. Think about what we're hearing from these folks in the, in the occupied zones. It's very similar. We have to do this for ourselves. In fact, we, we intend to do it for ourselves. Very old American virtue, self-reliance. And it should be the core of what we are building here now. Um, I think uh, the populace failed in concrete terms, but they set out to, to, to solve the problems for themselves and they built a series of ingenious cooperatives, agricultural cooperatives mostly, but also credit and so forth, which were uh, ultimately destroyed by the money classes, the bankers, but out of that they developed bigger ideas, I mean really bigger ideas about how to change this country and then, and then lost politically. But I, I would ask, we should ask ourselves, what are we building? What is it we can build that's, that's at parallel to, those, to that cooperative movement? Um, and I think, the, I think we're already seeing the answer to that in, in uh, McPherson Square in Washington and, and uh, on Wall Street and dozens of other places. They, 
paper I worked for many years ago um, is is uh, got a competitor now in Washington called the Occupied Washington Post, <laughs> and it pleases me <laughs> greatly to see that. <laughs> And, but now, I, and they had a, 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 the Occupied Washington Post has a poster type headline, we stand with the majority for human d needs, not corporate greed. That's a pretty good start on a program, I think. Yeah. And, uh, but I think the, I think what we're seeing now in our construction is beginning, believe it or not, to convince even the Washington Post. They have, if you check it out, in the style section today, they have a marvelous map of, of McPherson Square encampment done by hand with a kind of artist style and little labels of this and that and so forth. It's, it's quite beautiful. And accompanying it is a, one of their critics, their art and architecture critic, with what can only be called a, severe, a, a sincere appreciation of what he sees in McPherson Square. And it's the model of how this society could be organized. So that's, it's, it, people are gonna all say this, what a powerful teacher, takes my breath away. Now, in my last book, uh, Come Home America, oddly titled, I f sort of playfully f fantasized that what America needs is, a, is a, what we could call clubs for America. Lots of them, millions of them, really. People just coming together and having conversations. And um, one of my young friends who's a labor organizer said, well, who's gonna organize this? And I kind of shrugged and said, the people will. And he looked at me and rolled his eyes like, you know, that's nice. And we moved on to other <laughs> subjects. But guess what? That's, who, yeah. that's who's organizing this thing, the people. Yeah. And, and uh, isn't there... I mean, uh, so, Bill. I mean, there's something miraculous about that. And uh, Larry Goodwin, who's taught me so much, says, "This is hard to do. Movements fail. Most do not reach their goals. But they begin in what he likes to call democratic conversation." And I don't even ask him what he means by that because he has, he has said to me, not always, but on a couple of occasions, we have just had a democratic conversation. <laughs> and I think, God So Bill, I wanna, ask, I wanna ask Naomi <laughs> about, about building that, that different future. Um, and you, you know, I mean, you know, in your nation story, you argue um, that how we respond to climate change is fundamentally an economic issue. It's not just an environmental one. Um, and you write that, quote, the real solutions to the climate crisis are also our best hope for building a much more enlightened economic system, one that closes deep inequalities, strengthens and transforms the public sphere, generates plentiful, dignified work, and radically reigns in corporate power. And you end with quite a you know, beautiful section about how the occupiers themselves are already modeling that, that kind of work. What do, you, what do you see here as some of the potentials? Um, because it's one thing, uh, we, we were discussing this the other day, it's one thing to sort of stop something or to overthrow a dictator. It's quite another to build an alternative to neoliberal capitalism, also one that's going to be a solution to climate change. So what, what, what do you see here as the a, as, as a, as a tools to build right, this new economy and new society? Okay. Um I will answer that question. <laughs> but first, I just want to say how wonderful it is to be here and just what a fantastic panel this has been so far. Um, there's such, such just incredible richness of experience um, here. And, and, you know, for me, there's, there's a real mix of emotions in it. I mean, it's so incredible to hear this, to hear Michael Moore say he's never seen anything like this in his lifetime, or to, to have Bill Greider draw these parallels with transformative movements of the past, but at the same time, I don't know if you feel this too, it's also frightening, because it, I mean, it, 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 it is, um, it underlines the, the, the awesome um, responsibility of this political moment, um, that this is the no kidding around moment. Um, so much is riding on it, and we have to succeed. And, um, and that is thrilling as well as terrifying. Um, but but it's uh, but I think these are these are wonderful emotions. I think we are winning. We are starting to win, 
And I, I, I feel that particularly keenly today. And this relates to, to Richard's question about climate change. Because um, I've, I've been processing this, um, this thing that's happened, and I don't, I don't, I don't quite recognize it. It's a, it's, a, it's a strange feeling for me. But we actually won something today. And I'm really not used to that. <laughs> um, just a few hours ago, the White House announced that it is going to have a new environmental review for the Keystone XL pipeline. <laughs> the, that review is going to take at least a year. Um, <laughs> And the company that wants to build the, tr the, the, the Keystone XL pipeline, TransCanada, has said that it can't handle another delay, um, that their investors will lose faith. Uh, you know, investors don't like economic uncertainty. Um, and they've already dealt with a lot. The, the review is going to be looking at, um, at, at rerouting the pipeline around the Oglala Aquifer. Um, and TransCanada has also said that they can't reroute it around the aquifer and still have this project be economically feasible. So, okay, it's not the victory that we wanted. We wanted Obama to kill the pipeline um, because of what the pipeline is carrying, which is tar sands dirty oil, um, which is catastrophic no matter how you pipe it um, for, the, for the planet, um, uh, for the climate. Uh, but we knew we weren't going to get that. Uh, we, did, we, we knew we weren't going to get that in, a, in an election year um, because the right would have gone to town on Obama as a job killer. But we believe that this delay will, will kill the pipeline. And if it doesn't, um, if this pipeline re-emerges after the election, um, People have signed pledges saying they will put their bodies on the line to stop it. And the civil disobedience that I and um, uh, 1,200 others engaged in outside the White House with the arrests in this fall, that, th that this will become uh, actions in front of bulldozers. I mean, people are ready to take that type of action. And so we put them on notice. But you know, when we started this campaign, um, we we, and this was just three months ago that, the, that, that the, the first protests happened outside the White House, we thought we had a very slim chance of winning, like a kind of a 1% chance of winning. <laughs> um, and when Occupy Wall Street happened, uh, I had a co conversation with Bill McKibben, who has just been the powerhouse behind this campaign, just a hero. Um, and I said to Bill, I think this is helping us. What do you think? <laughs> And he said, I think it's helping us, too. Um, and, and, and the reason we, we, we believe this is because precisely for what, what, what Patrick was talking about, the, the, the ground has shifted, the climate has shifted. Uh, and what it would mean for Obama to cave in to, to this corporation, especially after it, we exposed all the cronyism going on between TransCanada and, and the State Department and TransCanada and the White House. Um, this kind of corruption is precisely what's on trial in parks and plazas around the world right now. And now that it's been exposed, this has become the ultimate example. We, you know, as Bill said, um, we uh, we're occupying um, we're, we're occupying Wall Street because Wall Street is occupying the State Department. Um, so there is a always there, there's been a clear connection between uh, and a conversation between these campaigns. I don't think we would have won without Occupy Wall Street. I really I, I I can't imagine how we could have. And this is what it means to change the conversation. And that's why this whole idea, you know, what are their demands and, you know, what, what are they trying to accomplish? There are already victories happening. Um, and this is just one example of it. So, um, so coming back to, to, your, to your question, Richard, um, you know, I think it, there has been an ecological consciousness woven into to these occupations from the start. I mean, you see that in the, the gray water system, the, perm, the permaculture, um, uh, training, the, uh, the composting, the fact that the food is coming from organic farmers, the food movement has been very involved from the beginning. Um, now, uh, I just learned this today, 
Uh, there, the, originally, it was traditional generators that, were, that was powering Occupy Wall Street. And then some people had the, the idea that they don't actually want fossil fuels to power, uh, to, to power uh, the laptops and, and, and the other energy needs of, of Liberty Square. So there was a move to bring in bicycle generators. Um, and this was starting, and then it got kind of expedited because the police came in and seized the generators. Um, so when I arrived at the park um, just on Monday, I went over to the sustainability table and checked in, and they had one functioning um, bicycle generator. And, <laughs> and I just left today. They have 14 functioning bicycle generators. <laughs> um, What's even more exciting is the way in which, I mean, what I think, one of the things, you know, I, I always compare at this moment to, to, to Seattle and, and, you know, this was the last time we were putting corporate capitalism on trial. Uh, and as we know, September 11th kind of wiped that movement off the map in this country. And the anti-corporate movement went dormant after 9-11. After uh, and we started fighting wars and torture and the whole Bush agenda. But the movement didn't disappear. A lot of people put their heads down and started building the economic alternatives to that model that we were protesting in Seattle and Washington and Genoa and around the world. And so that, so we've seen the explosion of farmers markets. We've seen the explosion of community supported agriculture. We've also seen a lot of cities and towns seriously try to relocalize their economy so that they were not dependent on a single a corporation that could just pull out and do to Flint, Michigan what, what Michael documented. Um, and, and now there's a track record. So when, and, and we've seen another example of this is, is the track record of community renewable energy, which is just phenomenal um, in creating real jobs and providing real energy. So 10 years ago when they said to us, what is your alternative? That was the way they tried to discredit us uh, 10 years ago. It wasn't, what are your demands? It was, what are your alternatives? You know, we didn't have a great answer to that question. Um, we didn't really have art articulated alternatives with a track record to point to, uh, certainly not close to home. You know, maybe we talk about Mondragon in Spain or something like that. Now we have 10 years of those experiences. You know, Cleveland's green co-ops, things like this. So. What I find exciting is the, the idea that the, that, the, that, the, that the solutions to the ecological crisis can be the solutions to the economic crisis. And that we stop seeing these as two problems to be pitted against each other by savvy politicians, but that we see them as a single, single crisis born of a single root, which is unrestrained corporate greed that can never have enough. And that is that mentality that trashes people and that trashes the planet, and that would shatter the bedrock of, of, of the continent to get out the last, the last drops of, of, of fuel and natural gas. It, it's the same mentality that would shatter the bedrock of societies to maximize profits, and, and, that, and that's what's being protested. We need to have a coherent agenda here. We need to have a co coherent narrative. And then we need to, as we, the, the discussion moves forward, to what, what do we want to build in the rubble of this failed system? I think that's the conversation, not what are your demands, but what do we want to build in the rubble of this failed system? Then obviously the solutions have to have the ecological crisis front and center once we realize that this is, this is the same crisis. And these are where the jobs are. I mean, where else are you going to get millions of jobs but in building massive public transit systems um, and a, a smart energy grid and green cooperatives? Uh, I mean, where, where, where else is this going to happen? So, I'm hoping that this will emerge, and I think it is starting to emerge, and, and I'm seeing this, you know, there, there are calls to occupy the food system, uh, to occupy the rooftops for solar energy. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's dispersed right now, but it, it's starting to weave together. Uh, and and, um, and I, think that will, that will, I think that will take this movement to, to the next phase beyond outrage, because we're in the outrage phase. Um, but we need to get into a hope phase of being able to imagine another economic model. Um, and, and the wonderful thing is, 
is it's, it, it's, it's not just our imagination. We can point to these real economic alternatives. And what's exciting to me is that the people who have been putting their heads down and building these alternatives at the local level don't just want to be a niche market. I mean, they've realized now, OK, we've, we've proved that community-supported agriculture can work, that farmers markets, everybody loves them. But we don't want to just be a niche market for yuppies. We actually want to change the food system. Um, and when these <coughs> things can come together and, and, the, and, 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 the, and Occupy Wall Street can make those movements more militant and actually confronting uh, the existing economic structures and really giving them a run for their money, um, then I think we'll see some, some real change. So, Naomi, Naomi, I'm going to ask you a cynical question because it's my job. Um, you know, and I want to then kind of thread it through the rest of the panel because I think it sort of touches on, on a big issue that, that has been sort of raised. And, you know, you, you, you write and talk about um, these sort of local solutions, right? Um, at a certain point, you know, don't we want big government involved, right? Don't we want um, government to provide massive subsidies to build solar, right? Are the solutions really going to be only on this sort of autonomous level that's being modeled at, at Occupy Wall Street? And I would extend... You know, that's a specific question for you on, on, mm -hmm. that, on the climate change issue, but I would extend that to, to the rest of the panel. Um, you know, Bill, you talked about sort of self-reliance as, as, as a model, but if we care about income inequality, you know, isn't, there, isn't the federal government the best mechanism to redistribute um, th th that wealth? Do we have other alternatives? Mm -hmm. so, um, and Rinku, if you're talking about you know, racial justice or immigration policy, isn't there some, some point Right, where, where this movement makes a demand and engages the state. And, and so, I, no, I, mean, I want to start with you specifically about climate change, but then maybe we could loop it back to Michael and just, just kind of go down the line on that question of what this movement's relationship is to the federal government or, or mm -hmm. to the state. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what this movement's relationship is, but I certainly, I certainly believe that we do need strong state action and strong state intervention. But at the same time, I think that that, that the kinds of action that we want from the state can systematically devolve power to the community level um, and decentralize it. I mean, that's what's exciting about these, all of these examples, with it's economic localization, community-based renewable energy, cooperatives. What they share in common is that they decentralize and devolve power. And, 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 and I mean, by their very nature. I mean, renewable energy, if you compare it with fossil fuels, you know, it, it's, it's everywhere. That's the point. That's why it is less profitable, because anybody can put a solar panel on their roof and have energy. And that's why there's such momentum against it from corporate America, because they want huge centralized solutions because they're way more profitable, which isn't to say that you can't make a profit. You just can't make a stupid profit. You just can't. <laughs> and so it, I think, you know, if we look at what, there's so much outrage over it, is that concentration of power, that vertical power. And so, yeah, I do think the solutions have to, have to disperse power, but that we won't get there without very strong intervention, national, international, local. Um, and you know, the, what I argue in the piece, as you know, is that I think that the right, is, the reason why the right is denying climate change now in record numbers, there are parts of this country where 20% of Republicans um, don't believe, 20% tw of, of Republicans believe climate change is a hoax. Sorry, 80%, 20% believe it's real. Um, so you have this complete, uh, this complete split where 70 to 75% of Democrats and independents believe climate change is real, and almost no Republicans believe that it's real. And so why is there ideolo this ideological split? If you listen to the climate change deniers, they believe this because they, because they have looked at what science demands They've looked at the, at the level of emissions cuts that science demands, 80% or more uh, by 2050, and they have said, you can't do that within our current economic model. This is a socialist plot. We would have, their entire ideology, uh, which is laissez-faire government, attacks on the public sphere, um, privatization, cuts to social spending, all of that, none of it can survive 
actually reckoning with the climate science. Because once you reckon with the climate science, you obviously have to do something. You have to intervene strongly in the economy. You have to invest massively in the public sphere along the lines that I was just talking about, these huge investments in infrastructure. Um, and, but, but at the same time, just because you, you're investing in infrastructure doesn't mean that you can't say that the transit system should be accountable to the people who ride it, right? right. Because I think that um, you know, this has been one of the great failures of the left, is, 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 is not understanding that state power can be just as alienating and just as corrupt um, as corporate power. And we, we, we have to have learned those lessons of the past. I mean, similar question to you, Michael. You've, you've made about the most compelling case for single-payer health care that, that I could imagine. You know, why, why isn't that a demand that Occupy Wall Street should make? I mean, what, what, what is that, you know, what do you see that role of, of this movement in, in fighting for these things that, that will require, you know, federal government, massive federal government intervention? I think that'll happen. I, I think we're watching the, the, we're in the infancy of this movement, um, and it will grow, and that that will happen. I have no doubts about that. I think um, um, the majority of the people in America would like that. And, um, and um, health care, um, in the same way that Na uh, Naomi was talking about um, um, the environmental issues in terms of how that impacts the economy, um, I think that that, uh, I think that that's, I think that's, I just think this is all going to happen. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and you can play this tape back in about <laughs> two years uh, because this is going to move very fast. This is one of these things where, you know, the, the, the part of the discussion we're having tonight is, you know, t trying to figure it out. And, and um, I think Malcolm Gladwell's point was well taken in his book, uh, The Tipping Point, that um, you can't create a tipping point. It just happens. And... Um, and people have tried to figure out how to do that, and, and then they go put their marketing head together, and it, it doesn't work. So I think that um, that this that I, if I remember the Adbusters call, um, one of the things that they said was that that the movement had to have one demand: just just come together with just get together in the park, and then and then come up with one demand. And that was such a crazy idea. <laughs> it was like. It would have killed the whole thing. It would have absolutely killed it. If this, because, because they're so frightened about this movement now. I mean, the, the Republican debate last night, they, it was brought up two or three times. The Republican presidential candidate, one of the candidates had to say, I'm part of the 99%. I'm for the, I mean, they're even using the language now. They're so frightened by this. Bank of America had to get rid of their shitty $5 debit, debit card fee. They're like... They're running so fast. They don't know. They can, they, you know, because they created this, you know, they created all the pain and suffering because it's their boot that's on the necks of the American people and the Canadian people and most of the people of this world. It's that they know that they feel now that we can buy candidates. Yes, we can buy candidates. I know, but we can't go in the booth and put our hands on everybody's lever. I know, I know, I know. Okay, well, we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll feed them a lot of <laughs> nonsense on TV, and that'll get them afraid, and we'll, we'll make their schools, like, so crappy that, that they'll be ignorant, and they won't know when we're trying to manipulate them with fear. And that's, you know, this is how we'll do it. And... And... <laughs> I just love, I just wish I could be in their bedrooms tonight. They're, they're just, uh, many of them are in Connecticut, and they're not far away. If anybody's watching, if, I would just love to just be in one of their bedrooms tonight. Just what they just have got to, they're just so got to be so frightened by this. Occupy Greenwich. Because it's, right. yeah, well, it's our, as long as. You know, our Bill is so right. You know, Bill has been such a warrior for trying to keep the the bare threads of our democracy that are still there intact. That we and that there aren't many left. We are really just hanging on by a few of these threads. And and if if, if one of those threads is one person, one vote, and so they can't really do anything about that. And we can, you know, you can say, oh, they can buy the votes. But listen, every if you to take our lessons, you mentioned all the previous movements and historic the historical implications of this. I mean, the, the women's suffrage movement that started in this state uh, in the 1840s, 
they, I mean, imagine the mountain that they had to climb. You know, people didn't sit around going, well, how are we going to get this amendment passed because we can't vote? I mean, seriously, no woman was ever going to be able to vote for their right to vote. I mean, it's just, it's, it, that must have seemed like the most impossible task. So we, what's great about, what's great about this movement is, <laughs> what's great about this movement is, is that we have to get out of our, our victim role. You know, this is why the word, the concept of Occupy, because Occupy until seven weeks ago was really a dirty word because we knew what it meant. <laughs> Those lands that are occupied by us in the Middle East, the West Bank, and Gaza by another country, you know. I mean, it's like, that's, <laughs> occupation, occupation is a dirty word. And you have, you have taken this, and you've just, all of us, everybody's a part of this, every, we've turned it on its, on completely on its ear, and now we've owned the word, and it's not like, it's not like, whoa, what are we, we going to do? <laughs> you know, it's like, no, we've occupied you now. We've occupied the Washington Post. We've occupied the Wall Street Journal. We're, and and that's, how, that's how this is going to go. But I just please want to second what Naomi said, that this is the no kidding around moment. Don't, my friends, please, the ship has sailed in. The ship will leave. As Bill said, many of these things that have happened in our 200 plus year history um, have failed or been crushed. And this is our moment. This is, this is the moment for it to happen. It will only happen if every single person in this room tonight, when you leave and you go home, you have to say to yourself, what am I doing? What can I do to be part of the occupation? What am I going to do to occupy Wall Street? Everybody watching this at home, on the nation's website, anybody watching this right now, every, every one of you, it doesn't matter, you're living in Boise, you're living in, 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 the, in the most faraway reaches of upper Minnesota, no matter where you are, I've, I've seen occupies that are two people big. <laughs> and it, this is where it's got to start. And it always starts that way, right? I mean, Marx, yeah. he just had angles. They were just, <laughs> that's all he had. I mean, it was like, they were, just, they were just two old farts sitting around keeping their hands warm over the fireplace in London, talking <laughs> shit to each other. And, and they, you know, they came up with this idea. Uh, and, 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 and JC, JC had 12 Fisher guys. Look what happened with that. Whoa. <laughs> So, so if you're at home and you're watching this and you're in some out-of-the-way place, you already own it. This is already your country. You, 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 you have been occupied by Wall Street. Your homes have been occupied by Wall Street. Your government has been occupied by Wall Street. Your media has been occupied by Wall Street. And it's okay for you to say, not anymore. Those days are over. End of story. Yeah. <laughs> Bill, uh, I, know you, I know you had your hand up, Bill, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to you to discuss this, but I wanted to weave in some questions now also, so this is one that I think I'm going to pitch to you, Bill, to, to fold in. There have been a couple questions here. Um, how do you see Occupy fitting into the upcoming 2012 elections? Um, do you think Occupy Wall Street should feed into candidacies outside of the ineffective neoliberal two-party system, a third party, question mark? Um, how do you see campaign finance reform as part of the solution? So, Bill, you've written about these issues, thought about third parties, and I'm going to ask you about them. You know, I think uh, this is why I keep going back to Larry Goodwin's very precise description of how a movement moves through sequences of development. And talking about next year's election is way out of line with the development of this movement, way out of line. And, and uh, I, let me take off on what Michael was saying. There's a broader way for this movement, whatever it will call itself, to have profound political impact. And that's an old fashioned political maneuver called fear. We need to put fear in the hearts of the regular system with the purpose of liberating the political system. I mean that literally, not just want to liberate the country from the 
suffocation and and uh, propaganda of of the of the economic system, but we but at the same time need to break free the representative system and perhaps change it profoundly. Uh, the second point uh, I talked about con democratic conversation, and this is hard. We need to learn how to have a democratic conversation with people who ain't like us. And uh, and, uh, and and my my conviction is I I. I'm not looking for evidence in polling or any place else, but I have a belief that we have natural allies who are in fact on the other side of the fence and we're throwing things at each other. And I, I don't want to overstate that because a lot of them are not going to be allies. They're, they're out to kill us or, or at least to crush us. But, but I, I, would, I urge you to, to do some sampling and I, now I'm going to make it harder. The most obvious a grouping that might be worth dipping into is a Tea Party movement. Um, not not easy to do for obvious reasons, but nevertheless, I'm convinced that if they understood what they are being sold and what they are being told is their objective, they would say, "No, no, not me. I'm not on that." And uh, and a second group, almost as difficult, but but more accessible maybe, is small business. And that's a very conservative group of people. Uh, I know enough of them to know that underneath the ideological framework, they agree with us on a lot of big stuff, including globalization, including, uh, including the way the big corporations push them around and push the country around. The third group is the real stretch. Hold your applause. <laughs> we need to talk to the military. And I mean, I mean the people from, from the bottom up. Changing of the guard. Changing of the guard, okay. Well, we can, we can both be for a smaller, more peaceable national defense strategy, and at the same time, f discover that a lot of the people in uniform feel and know that they are, they are the victims of this manipulation too. And, uh, yeah. I, I want to ask, I want to ask Patrick and, and, and Rinku, because Pat, Patrick, you mentioned the Tea Party in your, in your opening statements, and we have a question here, you know, how can and should the Tea Party be pulled into to be a part of Occupy Wall Street? Well, I mean, I think that it's uh, to a degree already happening. Um, we have a bunch of people down there who carry around Ron Paul signs or, and the Fed signs. <laughs> And, you know, I think all of us have, or at least I, I, I do, have uh, issues with those, uh, with, with, well, with Ron Paul and some of his, his, his ideas. Um, but, you know, the, these are people that are, are very easily accessible for our movement, I think, if we approach it the right way. Because these are people who have been as screwed over by the system as everyone else and who are more pissed off about it than most people. And... You know, they, they think that they've uh, gotten a solution, which has been uh, an involvement in the Republican Party and a supposed shift of, of their message, but in reality, they haven't shifted the message at all. And I, I think that that brings us back to the question about uh, this movement's involvement with the state. And I think, personally, it's very important that we don't become involved with parliamentary procedure and parliamentarianism. Um, I can understand the impetus to work from the government, but I think that the government, in its current form at least, is itself a very corrupting institution. And especially if we can't, or especially now that, that Wall Street is so firmly firmly ingrained in it. You know, like over the past 30 years, the actions of the Fed, the actions of Goldman Sachs have gone hand in hand. You know, we have these large financial institutions that are essentially running our money. And, you know, as long as that's the case and as long as they're running our campaign finances as well, you know, we're never going to win anything. We, we, we elected Obama. I think a lot of people in this room probably helped with that. And... He, he had more donations from Wall Street than any other candidate ever. And, you know, he, we, we elected a person who ran on change and hope, and now 
I don't, I don't have, I don't, I don't see too much change, and I don't have too much hope for him. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that what we're seeing is a rejection of this political binary, but also just the entire way of doing things. You know, this, this representation from other individuals, as long as they're more influenced by the money that comes into the system than they are to the voices that come into the system or the votes that come into the system, which is the way things are right now, we, we can't use the government. And, and that was the failure of the Tea Party. They had uh, a, a soapbox to, to, to make their, you know, their voices heard. And then as soon as they joined up with this institutionalized party, their voices were immediately uh, silenced and replaced by the same chorus of Republican you know, ideology that has, has existed for, for many years in that party. So, I, you know, again, this is, this is my personal opinion. You know, I, nothing I say up here is reflective of the movement as a whole. But I think personally that's something to be very, very worried about, becoming the Tea Party. <laughs> so, Rinko, to you, what, what about, what about this, this sort of Tea Party alliance that, that have some people salivating? You know, I think one of the signal polls for me early on was, was when you poll Tea Party people, um, a great majority of them said that the government is making too much of the problems of African Americans. Um, is, this, is this a kind of uh, movement that can join with Occupy movements? All this talk about the Tea Party, it really reminds me of this thing that happened that I experienced actually about 10 years ago. Uh, it was New Year's Eve and I was going to a party that was a potluck and I had gone to the grocery store to buy a pot roast because I was going to make pot roast, which I think is the most American piece of meat you could possibly buy <laughs> um, at the butcher shop. So I'm standing in a Safeway in California. I'm by the meat. I'm looking at all the meat. And there are two white people, middle-aged white people, standing right next to me. And I guess that the union that had been in that grocery store had just been decertified and lost. The workers had lost their union. And the white woman was saying, t telling the story to the white man and saying it's, you know, she was really angry about it. And she said it's really messed up that that happened and we lost our union. And, you know, I'm, I'm like nosier than I should be, I'm sure, and I, I eavesdrop a lot because I was an organizer and then a journalist, so I like to listen to everything. And so I'm overhearing them. I'm standing. They're, they're like where Naomi is. And so I butted in and I said, listen, I couldn't help overhearing your conversation and I've done a lot of work with unions over time and I just wondered what, which union was it? Was it the United Food and Commercial Workers or was it someone else? And the, neither one of them answered me, but the woman looked at me, she looked at me and then, but she spoke to her friend and she said, but now those blacks and Latinos, or she might have said those blacks and immigrants, now they can just get all the welfare that they want. And, uh, you know, as a, someone who's worked on racial justice for 25 years now, uh, it makes me very nervous to think about purely local control because purely local control for people of color has quite often meant that you went to segregated schools and you couldn't get a job and your housing was substandard and nobody would do anything about it. So people of color have needed the federal government in particular and to have some federal standards so that local <laughs> control didn't amount to us having our labor and our housing and our food and our uh, whatever little goodies we had stolen. And so it seems to me, you know, I like my government, I want it back. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to give it up to somebody who thinks that the only role of government is to make the 1% richer and to take other people's stuff for that 1%. So I think that we have to have a... Um, we have to do a couple of things. One is, uh, in the public will building project that we're all now a part of, since we all occupy everything, um, in that public will pro project, we need to be able to explain to that white lady who thought that there was absolutely nothing that she had in common with me, that um, it's the same government that allowed that union to be 
easily decertified that also actually took away welfare, not just from people of color, but from white people too, mostly white people who really needed it. And it's that same government that we need to get back in order to protect working people of all colors. So I'm not quite ready, uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready to, um, I think the government we have now is not the government that we need to have, and it's not the one that we must have. I think changing it is entirely possible. I feel so much more hopeful about that now than I did two or three months ago, so thank you very much. Uh, but we have to have a discussion about the government that doesn't just reinforce its uh, crappiness, you know, because that, that, that reinforcement just makes wider openings for libertarians. And I don't think that libertarianism and anarchism are the same thing, right? Anarchism is about self-governance and elevating, elevating people's ability to be in community and work things out. Uh, whereas libertarianism is every man for himself and you're just totally on your own. So I, I try to draw a lot of distinctions between those two things and I think that for people of color in particular and also for working people, you've got to have some form of governance that, prote that is about protecting us uh, from having all our stuff taken. <laughs> yeah, Michael. Add, uh, I just want to add a couple points uh, to, the, to that. The, the Tea Party, as it exists now, is a Koch brothers a funded, uh, a, you know, group. It's not that the, uh, the Tea Party at the beginning may have had a number of, of well-intended working Americans concerned about what was going on after the crash, but it quickly morphed into a racial thing, um, uh, much, very much against Obama. And um, so it's very hard to talk. Uh, to these people, but um, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up, and you all have a conservative brother-in-law. Um, <laughs> there's someone in your family that's a Republican, and you're going to be sitting at the same table. And so, let me just make a quick suggestion: what you can do uh, to help build the movement. And I've learned it basically by being down at Liberty Square and talking to these Ron Paul people, <laughs> and uh, which they're very. I like. I enjoy talking to them. And what I say to them uh, is: is this. Um, we have more in common than not. You know, if we really got out a, a piece of paper, drew a line down it, and made a list of the things that we care about in life, we really share more than the things that we're opposed to. So why don't we agree to disagree on the things that we don't agree on? If you don't want to have an abortion, don't have one. You know, if, if, if I don't want... If I don't want 12 guns in my cabinet, I'm, I'm not going to get them. You'll skip the gun uh, show. I'm not going to go to the gun show. Um, if, if, if you don't want to have sex with another man, uh, for God's sake, don't do it. Uh, you know, <laughs> but, if, but if those two guys want to have sex, what do you care? <laughs> Well, you know, it's, it's like, let's, I think that's a good way to try to approach those who are on the, on the, other, on the other side. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste a lot of time on it, and this is why. Uh, America has changed. It's not about that middle-aged white couple in the supermarket anymore. Barack Obama won with a 10 million vote margin, three times what Bush beat Kerry with. Um, and he lost the white vote, all right? 57% of white men voted for McCain. 53% of white men voted for, um, 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 I'm sorry, white women. 53% of white women voted for McCain. All right? Barack Obama lost every white age demographic except 18 to 29 year olds. <laughs> That's the only, it's the only white demographic he had. So, so much of our political discussion, so much of the chat shows, the pundits, everything, it's, there's this sort of mythical white guy in middle America that we're trying to please or we're trying to convince or whatever. And while, yes, he is an American too, and, and, and you should have that conversation I suggested at, at Thanksgiving dinner, but in the end, we are a different country now, and thank God for young people. And I think the success of the Occupy movement I, I want to encourage at its nuclear core 
that young people run this. The, the attitude that he expressed about Obama when, when he, you know, this is what's great about being young. You know, as we get older, we just, we have to learn to get along and, and we put up with a lot of nonsense. But when you're 18 or 20 or 22, you know, you don't, you don't suffer any fools and you don't take, you don't take any BS. And so when Obama says he's, you know, going to do things and then two years later he hasn't done it, people, well, young people didn't show up in 2010. Thank you. In some way, I mean, it's been really rough. But I'm, I'm glad that young people don't tolerate this crap and will just go, Dad, <laughs> you, you said you were going to close Guantanamo. <laughs> <laughs> he, I worked the phone banks for you. I knocked on doors. We need that energy. We need that. We need that. And, and, and uh, the, the, the final thing I want to say is in terms of if, we, if there's anything we should need to do politically, it's to get that constitutional amendment passed that, that says corporations are not people. And that has such wide support across the country. We, and, and in that, in that same amendment, we need to take money out of politics. Once, once we do these two things, once we do that, then, then the 400 can't, can't control it. Uh, so th I just, those are the things I wanted to add. Thank you. Actually, <coughs> Rinko, go ahead. Just, just a couple of quick things. I mean, um, you know, I don't want to be with that white couple because I think I need them to win. It's clear that I don't need them to win. We, people of color, are rapidly becoming the absolute majority in this country and certainly in the lower, in the uh, newer generations, that's more and more true. But I think I need to be able to relate to them because they're my neighbors, because whatever I build, they're going to be there. And uh, we're going to either move forward really, you know, in this antagonistic uh, relationship or we're going to move forward um, in a more together way. Am I going to get all of them? No, absolutely not. But it seems important to try to get as many as, as get possible. As you can. Um, and right. And <laughs> there, there is a way. And then run, yeah. There, but they might make good pot roast in which I might want the recipe. Um, the, the red meat is <laughs> But <they're>, sorry. <laughs> I'm so not a vegetarian. We could put them on the bicycles at least, you know? And the thing is, there is a way for the 400 to control, to change the one person, one vote thing, and that's called voter suppression. It happens all yeah. the time. It happened last, just two days ago on Tuesday. We've got voter ID laws now in many states, too many states, and the federal government, the Department of Justice, is, has decided not to challenge voter ID laws, the ones that say you must have a driver's license or your birth certificate in order to show up and vote. So, uh, so I just think, you know, triumphalism, I, I, I'm so into this moment. I, I'm, I'm more excited than I've been in a long time. But I think that we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. There's a lot of work still yet to do uh, every day in every part of the country. And um, and we just have to do it, I think, more than think about what's coming. Just, just do the work every day and worry not so much about how we're going to win, whether we're going to win, when we're going to win. We're going to win if we do the work. Okay. So I have a, there's Michael. a question for Bill and Naomi coming up that's a, that's a whopper. But I want to I get Patrick, I, I, we have to ask you this because it's very important. Yes. And I want to make sure we have the time for this. Question to you. How are you going to weather the winter at Liberty Square? And how can we help you? Okay. Um, well, I'll answer, the, the, this, I'll answer that in reverse order. You can help us uh, by going to occupywallst.org slash donate. We have uh, donation links for every single occupation. It's very important that we, we feel that you don't just focus on us. We have $500,000. There are places that don't have very much money at all. But we also have... Uh, you know, uh, uh, things that you can actually buy and send to us, which is, I think, preferable. Um, tents and, and so forth. But, you know, igloos aren't illegal. Uh, <laughs> so there's always that. So but is, is it true? I heard that there's, there, some people came from Occupy Anchorage uh, to provide some consultation on how to do winter 
Uh, and I heard that, I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that there's an ice company in New Jersey that has actually offered, if you want to build igloos, they'll provide the ice really? uh, for these igloos. <laughs> but that's just, that's the crazy nature of this. Some ice guy in New Jersey is just going, I'm going to occupy with my ice, you know. Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't know about that, but I know that there are many different uh, organizations that are very interested in helping us uh, uh, maintain our position throughout the winter. And I think it's very important. You know, there have been people who have said that, that we could potentially leave the space and occupy, you know, the internet or... or Something warmer. Yeah, from the inside <laughs> of our houses. I think that's right out. I think we need to maintain our space. I think that the, the way that we... The way that we've distinguished ourselves from protests is that we don't leave. You know, this is this is a something that we can't just go home at the end of the day from. You know, I mean, I try every once in a while, and it doesn't really work. Um, but this this idea that winter will be hard, but we're we're so dedicated. You you go down there, and you can just feel it, you know, radiating off of these people. The dedication when when there was the that freak snowstorm that happened, you know, we, we just buckled down. You know, it was, it was sleeting horizontal and, and people were just, you know, staying there and, and occupying the space and making sure that we held the square. You know, that's, that's important to us. We took that square, we're not, we're not giving it up. So here, here's, a, here's a question that I think both, both Naomi and Bill could, could shed light on. Um, uh, it says, Iceland's response to its financial crisis has been the opposite of austerity. It basically just said, screw you, Europe. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, this has not been a model here, and it's not been really discussed here in, in, in the U.S. So I wanted to ask both of you, you know, is this, is this um, what can we learn, you know, from other, other places that have sort of resisted austerity? And, and not just not just Iceland, but in Argentina in, in 2001 and, and other places. What are, what are the sort of models out there that are global? Um, well, I think there, yeah, there are certainly um, there, there are good examples and there are also warnings. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a troubling moment. And I, and I mean, if we look at what's happening now in Greece and Italy, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a downer because, you know, I think that, that uh, this is an incredible moment. But Europe has been in revolt now for a couple of years, uh, occupying plazas and, and really fighting like they mean it. Um, and, and they're getting, they're, they're, they are getting stomped on right now. Um, the, the, the dangers of, of of globalization and what it has done to democracy. I mean, this was always the reason why we opposed these trade deals, was that they massively reduced the democratic maneuvering space in countries. And you see this so clear within the European Union where everyone's united in a single currency. They don't, you know, they've done this trade. You're allowed to vote, but we are gonna maintain control over all of the economic levers. And that was, that was always the deal. You hollow out democracy, you outsource the running of the economy to a technocratic class, um, and look at how little maneuvering space Greece has, Italy has. Um, and the solution now being proposed is an outright assault on democracy in those countries. Now Greece is run by a banker who has not been elected to a single post. Same thing is happening in Italy. Um, and you can't say it's because they didn't fight. They did fight, um, and they are still fighting. There are structural, there are, are structural barriers um, that, 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 that turn democracy into a joke. And that's why, you know, what, what Michael was talking about, about corporate personhood, I mean, what we need to be doing is identifying what are the barriers to real democracy in this country. Um, and I agree completely with Patrick, this is not about running candidates. This is not about just, um, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, right? I mean, people had a hell of a lot of hope uh, for Obama and really thought they were going to get that change. A lot of people did. And why didn't it happen? Because of these structural barriers. So if there's, I think this movement absolutely should be intersecting with structures of power, but where it makes sense to intersect 
is once you identify, okay, what are the biggest barriers? So campaign finance, corporate personhood, media concentration. I mean, also advertising. Um, we need, we, there needs to be much, much stricter regulation uh, on advertising and political advertising and, and corporate speech and all of that. So we need to do that. This is what the Europeans are gonna need to do to get control, to, to, get, to get their democracies back to the extent that they had them in the first place. <laughs> and they need to deepen their democracies because we're, we are, the, the limits of neoliberal democracy are just so dramatic, be, dramatically exposed in this moment. And you know, look, Greece's referendum was, uh, the, the idea of holding a referendum on the terms of the bailout was very manipulative. It, it was, it, you know, it, it was not gonna be a fair vote in the first place. But in that moment, when the whole global economy reels back in revulsion at the idea of people actually having the ability to vote on their destiny, on their economic destiny, on, on the decisions that are going to affect them for decades to come, you really see the way in which this economic system is at war with democracy. Um, this is our fight. And, and this is what, you know, I, was, I think about Ava, when Evo Morales was elected to, to power in Bolivia, um, he said, I'm a prisoner in the presidential palace because I'm locked in by all of these neoliberal laws. I can't do what people elected me to do. And he tried to systematically take away some of those constraints. Um, in Argentina, Ar I think Argentina is a really good example. Yeah. Um, you know, tell it, us about that. Well, yeah. I mean, in, in Argentina, I, I keep thinking about Argentina. We were, we were there um, after the economic crisis in 2001. We made a documentary film called The Take um, about uh, workers whose factories were being shut down in the midst of the economic crisis. And rather than, uh, the, the prospect of becoming unemployed in, in, in the middle of an economic crisis where I think 80% of the country was unemployed, the prospect of that was so terrifying that people just simply refused to be fired. Um, and they just camped out in their factories. One of the factories we, we, we followed, the Brookman Clothing Factory, they stayed because they didn't have bus fare home. So they stayed in their, in, by their machines. These were seamstresses, many of them immigrants. And they, they decided to just wait until the bosses came back and at least gave them bus fare to go home. But the bosses never came back. So they were like, well, we do know how to work these machines. Um, and so they started making suits, which is what the factory made. Uh, and they, sort of, they started paying the debts and paying the bills. And suddenly, they had a working factory. So we followed a few of these stories. Um, what, what happened in Argentina in that moment is instructive on a, on a bunch of levels. Um, so because I lived there for those two sort of incredible years when there were neighborhood assemblies, hundreds of them at every street corner in Argentina, that's what this moment reminds me of. I never thought I would see it in this country. And when we screened the take in 2004, you know, in audiences, you know, at the film forum in New York, I remember the discussion afterwards. We showed the film, first question, every screening. Okay, that's very nice for them, but do you think this could ever happen in America, or do things need to get really bad? And we would always say, no, they don't need to get, you know, I hate this idea that things need to get really bad before people are going to react. I mean, what a horrible idea. But, I mean, when you, we show the take now, and we're actually showing the take tomorrow at Occupy Wall Street, people do not react like that. They just take notes. They're like, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> we're there. They're bad. Um, but what's interesting is that, so you had this explosion of participatory democracy in Argentina. Um, the slogan of the occupied factories was occupy, resist, produce, okay? The first stage is you, you occupy your factory. Um, the second stage is you resist police repression <laughs> because it's gonna come, right? And the way you resist p police repression is you make friends with all your neighbors. Um, you turn yourself into a community project. And that meant, you know, for one of the factories, that they were producing tiles. That meant giving tiles to the hospitals and schools and things like that. Um, so that when the police came, they had slingshots, they, um, which with the ceramic tiles. Um, but they didn't actually have to use them because there were so many hundreds of people outside their factory that the police just turned around and left, just like at Occupy Wall Street when they tried to evict them. But the third piece of it was produce, was produce. Um, and what's interesting, looking back on that political moment, is that the neighborhood assemblies, which were just about the, the experience of direct democracy in the moment, um, sort of fell apart because they didn't find a way to intersect with 
structures of power and the, and the bigger political conversation that was happening in the country. Um, and, and so when the economy recovered a bit, they, 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 they disappeared. But the factories are still there. 200 occupied factories are still there. They're still growing. Um, and, and, and so I think there is a lesson in that about, about the next stage for this movement, that there has to be some kind of a producing stage. Um, and you know, producing can mean all kinds of things, but, it, but, but the occupying mm -hmm. and the resisting isn't enough um, to, to, to last for the long haul. Phil, um, yeah. Phil, I wanted to get to you on this question. Uh, listening to Naomi remember uh, Argentina reminds me that I sent her or, or her husband, Avi Lewis, who's sitting over there, a sort of forlorn email saying, you guys are down there on the barricades seizing factories with the workers, and I'm back here in Washington in America writing sappy little sermons about worker ownership. You know? I mean, I felt like time had passed me by. Let me make two quick suggestions for discussion that could be strategies that would resolve some of what we've all been talking about here. <clears throat> One is what Michael was mentioning was a constitutional amendment on money <laughs> in politics and, and, and the personhood of corporations, we could, in an hour of conversation, we could make a pretty good list of 10 or 12 constitutional amendments that ought to be on the table. And they, of course, that's extremely difficult to accomplish. It takes years. But as the right has always understood, they are marvelous organizing tools. And you can be selective about it. You could start, actually, with FDR's Second Bill of Rights in 1944 and, and ask publicly, how come these didn't all come true? Some of them did, you know. And, and out of that conversation, make a strategy around it which will speak to people everywhere across these boundaries. Because they would, what they would say is, we know the federal government will run out on what its commitments are under certain pressures. And labor rights is one of the obvious examples. They've done that. They just destroyed the meaning of the Wagner Act, which was 80, was 70, 80 years old. So we're going to, the, to put in the Constitution rights that have not yet been expressed there. That's one possible strategy. The other one is more immediate and, and I think tangible. And that is, uh, it's, in, it's in Europe, it's, but it's in this country as well, and that is debt forgiveness. I had a, uh, a piece in the, uh, in the nation uh, a week or two ago called uh, Jubilee American Style. And Jubilee, as you know, is the biblical, uh, actually ancient civilization, Israel, Babylon, a whole bunch of others in the Middle East worked out a genuine economic slash moral uh, answer to inequality where the, the usurer gets everybody's property because they've failed on their debts. That's happening right now in America. It's happening right now, writ large in Europe. And yes, we can go to the barricades, but, but the real solution is to write down those debts. And you can do that for college loans. You can do it for, especially for mortgages. You can, you can make your own strategy and, and proposal about it. But I say this with, with enthusiasm. I'm always too enthusiastic about these things. But I actually think this issue is going to be at the center of our politics before this trouble is over. How, how big is that problem, Bill? The, the, the well, it's, it's, and it's, the a, it's, a moral, it's a moral imperative, obviously, with the people's lives being destroyed by, by debts they can't repay and debts which the banks will never collect because these are dead, this is dead debt paper. And in, and in capitalism, when that happens, if the players are big enough, they work it out. That's what the bankruptcy law is about. That's what the, the right, right outs, workouts are about with bonds and big banks and so forth. It's only when you come to people in their homes or their, their personal debts that the law is strict and says, no, 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 it would be immoral to write down your debts. You have to pay every last penny. That's what's going on right now in America, and it's really obscene. These banks know they're not going to collect on these failing mortgages, but they squeeze the, the homeowners till they get the last drop. Yeah. And this is ancient and sin, and really there's no other word for it. So I think, 
I'm just suggest. I don't. I don't. I'm going to be the last person to say what this amorphous movement should do. It will decide well enough on its own. But it's something to look at. Could you mobilize right now? Uh, you want to know what we're for? We're for forgiving the debtors. That's what the Bible says. Let's do it that way. And and uh, and don't fall into the to the regulatory language that the uh, front, unfortunately our mm -hmm. White House is depending on and our Treasury Secretary, and they'll all explain how, well, that's terrible, you're, you're undermining your moral hazard. If you forgive somebody their debts, next thing you know, you'll make the bankers they'll pay, the pay back their money, right? I mean, <laughs> that's the moral hazard, of course. The bankers have already been forgiven in America. Yeah. True, Michael, did right? you want to weigh in? I, I just wanted to, yes, just echo what, um, what Bill said about um, students. Um, it's a crime that uh, we send 22-year-olds not out into the world, but into a debtor's prison. They're in a virtual debtor's prison from the minute they leave school. And, and while that, that leads to um, a, a, you know, very, a crushing blow to them personally, but I want to just say a word about how it affects us as a society. Um, if, you know, our, if our young people are not allowed in their youth to explore, uh, to experiment, to discover, I mean, this is, I, I'm just, I wonder what, what's the next great invention that we're not getting, or, the, or the, what cure, or what, what piece of culture, what music, what, you know, the things that young people used to do, the things that when they, when they were, when they didn't have, when they weren't saddled with this debt, um, they did things, they created things, and it moved the society along. It made things better for people. And I wonder what we're missing out on um, from what great genius idea or mind or whatever is, that is sitting there tonight more concerned about how to you know, make this month's loan payment uh, uh, something that they're going to have to worry about for the next, some of them, for 20 years yeah. or longer. And it, 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 uh, I think it affects all of us in, in a... Uh, and I, I, I agree with you. I just think that's a, such a great idea, and I think it's a, I think it's one idea that will resonate with so many Americans, um, because everybody wants their kids to be able to to go out into life, um, uh, not in a debtor's prison. And I think that that people will really would really respond to that. I think more ideas like that <clears throat> will um, will help build this uh, tsunami against uh, Wall Street and the banks. Yeah. I, I so I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask a final question that, that we're going to go down the line, and I, hopefully you could weave whatever you're going to say into this. And this is a sort of amalgam of, of questions, but I think it's a good to, one to end on. Um, you know, which is when you're down there at Liberty Square, you feel incredibly powerful. It's an amazing feeling, right? And then you walk a few blocks away, and it's like people coming home from Wall Street, going to Century 21 to look for shoes, shopping, you know? <laughs> Um, and you start to feel lonely, right? Um, so so here, here's a question. What is the biggest problem or obstacle facing the Occupy movement now? What is it, what's preventing it from growing even bigger? And what can we do about it when we leave here today? Um, so Patrick, I'm going to ask you to take that first. Sure. Um, OK, well, this is going to sound a little confusing probably at first. but. I think the biggest problem is Liberty Square. I think the biggest problem is the fact that people think that that's where the occupation of Wall Street happens. That's not where it happens. It happens wherever you choose that it happens. And so Michael was talking about how two people together make an occupation. One person by themselves makes an occupation. You know, this isn't something that should stop at Liberty Square. This isn't something that once your town has a single occupation, you should stop at. This should turn into neighborhood assemblies. This should turn into occupying uh, you know, where you work, sit down strikes for everyone. And, and th this is the reality that we're facing, is that if we don't start to really, really, really change things, you know, we're, we're not going to be able to ever. You know, and that's, we're, we're getting to that moment. Very, you know, the ship is going to leave, like, like you said. And I'm, I think everyone here is on board that ship already, or, or most of us at least. And so it's, it's you know, very much, 
our duties to carry this forward, to make sure that this doesn't stop. You know, because if, if this is Liberty Square, that can be stopped. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But this right here, talking about these ideas, making these ideas reality, as long as we make sure that that doesn't stop, we will keep winning. Naomi, Naomi, did you, or Bill, did you want to address, you know, that, that question, what, what do you think the sort of biggest obstacle is and, and what can people do now when they leave here? Moi? I'm, I'm asking this of I all just, of you. Uh, so, I yeah. just mentioned, um, and I, I, I repeat my sappy, mushy American confidence. I think people, Americans are capable. They, they can answer these questions pretty much for themselves. But I just mentioned out of our past again, the populace in a few short years had alliances in every county through a dozen states. They elected some governors, they elected some senators, they had a bunch of members of the House of Representatives. But to get there, they didn't start in politics. In fact, they resisted going into politics. They started by educating themselves in conversation. And by the, at the peak of that movement, they had they had lecturers in every congressional district who were just people who understood the agenda and understood the arguments over the agenda and would go to meetings and explain them to people. They had something like 40,000 lecturers in the country at the height of the movement. They had their own newspapers, one of which was called the National Economist, which was the authority on reforming monetary policy. This is way before the Federal Reserve was created. And their ideas, were let, pushed aside by the banking community since they didn't want democratic money, and they didn't get it with the Fed. But they, but they had a group called the National Reform Press Association, who were, some of which were little ragtag weekly newspapers that sometimes didn't make it to the stand. But they had, Larry Goodwin wrote, the only thing that united these reform journalists was their poverty. And that's, and that's what we have to look for now. The only thing that needs to unite us now is that sense that we've expressed tonight again and again, the spirit that this is not the country that we wanted and, and it's not the country we will endure. We will change this country and go with that without worrying about who defines it when. I'm sorry, we're gonna we're gonna proceed with the panel, and we, you could you could there's gonna be a time if you want to come up afterwards to ask the panelists questions. Thank you. Um, I th I think the biggest obstacle is our our own bad habits, so just falling back on our uh, on our on our habits, which are pretty much fear based. Because I think that, um, like I said at the beginning, this is a thrilling moment, but it's also a terrifying moment. I mean, if you th if the task is to figure out how to rein in ephemeral virtual global capitalism, let alone transform it, okay? Let alone doing what we need to do to actually deal not just with the economic crisis, but the ecological crisis, which means to challenge the entire ideology of endless growth and acting as if we can grow forever on a finite planet. I mean, nobody's ever figured out how to do this, right? So we have to start from the premise that we are in uncharted territory, and we, we can draw little bits of inspiration and say, you know, Argentina defaulted on their debt, that was good, Iceland's doing some interesting things, but actually on the global scale, in terms of what we're talking about, in the belly of the beast, no, it's never been done. And that is terrifying, and when people are terrified, they. There is a tendency to just do what you know, right? I mean, when I spoke at Occupy Wall Street for the first time, you know, I spent a lot of the, the talk, uh, to talk uh, uh, encouraging people to, to really treat each other with kindness. Um, because when you, when you pick a fight with the most powerful interests in, in, the, in the history of the world, which is what has happened down there, um, you know, there is always going to be a tendency to pick a fight with somebody you know, where you have a little bit of a better chance of winning, like the person sitting next to you, you know? Um, so, 
that's one of our bad habits on the left. We know that. We do this. We, you know, we, we turn on each other. We're excellent at it. <laughs> um, you know, some, we, but we also um, sometimes use theory as a weapon to rationalize doing nothing. Um, and and that, that's another bad habit that, 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 that we have to be really aware of. So the, I think we are, we are our worst enemies. Um, we, need, we need to be aware that fear is driving it. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the fear is the fear of the responsibility and the potential uh, of, of this moment, of going into really uncharted territories. At the same time, what's so exciting about, about Occupy Wall Street is that spirit of creativity that infuses the whole project um, and the integration of art um, and, and experimentation and it is so important, um, and it's important because it encourages that 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 uh, that that courage to go into uncharted territory. Um, so all the things that are sort of easy to make fun of, the sort of flakier parts of it, they're in they're they're integral to the success of of, of this movement. I think. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Rinko. So. Um, I just have to take this opportunity to give a shout out to my colleagues from the Applied Research Center who are here, my board chairs. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm so in love with my coworkers right now because uh, they are so optimistic and hardworking and, and doing such important work. I think the biggest obstacle, my biggest fear for the movement is that it will, um, that it might eventually give in to the pressure to stop using consensus because uh, more hierarchical and more traditional organizations don't use it. They use some kind of modified hierarchy. That's certainly true for us. And it works for us for what we're trying to do. But I think that consensus is so critical to the Occupy movement. And it's so, it's such an important experience to have if, if, if the people in this audience and the folks watching at home have not actually experienced it, I'd really urge you to go and put your body down there and, and be part of making some decision. It might take four hours and you'll be, and at the end of four hours you'll say, wow, that went by really fast and look, we have a decision and we're all in it together. So I think uh, one real obstacle will be holding on to that when there's tons of pressure, time pressure, um, political mm -hmm. pressure, pressure from allies and pressure from within, probably, mm -hmm. to do something more, quote unquote, efficient. Michael so Moore, last words. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I should I'm, never I'm, say that to Michael Moore, no, <laughs> last words. No, I'm just, I'm just so giddy uh, with <laughs> optimism, and I, and I want to encourage the cynics uh, out there that, that, that we need to put aside the cynicism uh, for a while. And, and, the, and the sort of shared belief that we have that um, we don't really have any control over this, the whole thing, we're screwed, it's all, it's, it's all of this, we need to really, just, even, just try optimism, just try being optimistic <laughs> about this, even if, even if it, it won't kill you, first of all, I can tell you it won't kill, I, I, I just had my first tomato about three years ago, I swear to God, I'd never eaten a tomato, and it didn't kill what? me. And I was like, you know, and I had a second one, and then I had a third one, and I, but I had to, I had to, I had to try that first one, and so I'm encouraging you to try a different method, and to and to learn from um, uh, the kids, because the kids are all right, and <laughs> the uh, um, and and. And let me just give you two or three practical things that maybe you can do when you leave here. Again, let me just say, you, because there is no leader of this movement, and that everyone is a leader in this movement, and that, and that we, you know, we referred to Patrick here as being from Occupy Wall Street, but he'll be the first to tell you that you're from Occupy Wall Street just by the fact that you're here tonight. So we're all Occupy Wall Street. And when you go home tonight, if you live a block away from here, you know, tomorrow morning, you can start Occupy 13th Street. You know, you can just go down the block and talk to your neighbors. And you can figure out what, what, would, what could Occupy 13th Street do. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's, again, it's, maybe we need to cut up our credit cards. Maybe we need to join the credit union. If, if you need a credit card, you can get one through them. Maybe it's the candidate that's running for office, uh, for Congress, 
in this next election. 13th Street demands that whoever is running for the U.S. Congress not take a dime of money from the banks or from Wall Street. You know, Occupy, Wall, Occupy 13th Street says so. But, but you can do this if you're watching this tonight. If you're in Dubuque, you're in Des Moines, you're in whatever it begins with a D. You're, you're yeah, well, yes, that's another. Oh, Detroit has been occupied and is ready to occupy. But, uh, but it's, it, you, you have this power. And I think our biggest obstacle, Richard, is that this sense of that we're alone and the loneliness that people have felt for so long that you live in this town or on this block, you're in the PTA at school, you think you're the only one, you just gotta sit there and listen to this whatever. But you're, what I wanna tell you tonight is that you're not the only ones. That the America you live in is full of people just like you who've been going through the same struggles you've been going through and who feel the same way that you feel. This is not a conservative country. This is not a Republican country. This is a liberal, progressive country. And I'm not just saying that for purposes of rhetoric. I'm stating a fact. I'm, I'm stating an absolute fact. You go down the list of the issues on virtually every issue, other than the death penalty and maybe in one other, the American public comes down on the liberal, progressive side of these issues on every single issue. The majority of your fellow Americans have been opposed to these wars now for the last few years. The majority of Americans want stronger environmental laws, not weaker ones. Every poll shows this. The majority of Americans believe women should be paid the same as men. That's a liberal progressive issue. And in September, for the first time, the polls showed that 54% of your, your, your fellow Americans, 54% now believe that gay marriage should be the law of the land, the entire country. That's the America you live in. That's your America. So don't, don't think of this country as, you know, out there past the Hudson River, and it gets really, uh, and then you get to the Pennsylvania border, and it's really dark, <laughs> forests and crazy people. Um, and yes, there are crazy people. Uh, there could be at least 50 million of them, for all I know. But it's a big country. That means 250 million aren't crazy. It means your fellow Americans, you know, the great thing about this movement is that unlike past movements, the feminist movement, uh, the civil rights movement, you know, we have now, if you look at the polls this week, I mean, depending on which one you read, the National Journal said 59% of Americans agree in principle with what Occup Occupy Wall Street stands for. Um, and there are many polls that, where the numbers go up and down, but it's, but it's all ahead of, do, do, do you like Occupy Wall Street or do you like Wall Street? <laughs> and there's no poll where there's like not a two to one margin <laughs> for that. So that's, the con that's this new movement already has the majority of Americans with it. That, you could not say that at the beginning of the feminist movement. Even in the 60s, right? You didn't have 59% of the American people with that. 59% of the American people weren't with civil rights in 1954. 59% of the American people weren't against the Vietnam War in 1964 and 65. It took years, didn't it, for those movements to succeed. This movement already has the backing, the, the, the gut checked feeling of the majority of your, our fellow Americans. So we don't have to do that hard work of trying to convince them to come to our side. They're on our side. They're already here, and we're with them. We're on their side. So this is a gr the, 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 the fertile ground that's, that is now, now exists, the possibilities of what you can do um, are endless. And I encourage you to be creative and to think of what you can do with the Occupy movement because you are all, you've all been appointed leaders and spokespeople of this movement because everybody in this room Everybody in this room has a story to tell of what life has been like for the last decade or two or three. And you need to tell those stories. Do not think that Michael Moore or Naomi Klein or the people camped out on Liberty Square are going to be your spokespeople. We're not. You have to be your spokespeople. We are all going to do this together, and there is no stopping this. So thank you for being here, and go out and do the work that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you.
Here is to no longer being alone, and here is to our wonderful panel this evening. Thank you for coming, everybody. Occupy.